and let me say I'm, I'm Harold Harmus and I'm glad to be back at this podium uh, five years after my last appearance here in, uh, in 2011. Um, at that time, uh, my class, the great class of 61, uh, permit me a moment of chauvinism, uh, was celebrating its 50th reunion and uh, on that occasion I tried to rise to the august heights of a 50th and, and talk fairly broadly about um, life in science in America, uh, what the, how the public supports science, uh, what the major institutions are that do it, um, what we have witnessed as 50-year uh, veterans of, uh, of the, the growth of American science and the unveiling of um, many deep truths about how um, organisms work, unveiling of a human genome, a lot of progress in medicine, across uh, many disciplines, and focused quite a lot on the National Institutes of Health, where I was trained as a scientist after being an English major at Amherst and going to graduate school in English, going to medical school for a while, getting clinically trained, uh, and then, um, then heading to BNI, where I served as the director in the 1990s, and, uh, where uh, in, in 2011, I had taken up a new position a year earlier as the director of the National Cancer Institute, after having served for ten years as the um, as the president of Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, so in the course of this talk, while I tried to talk about big themes in science, how we got to the moon, how we we did in response to Sputnik, what uh, how America's made its investments in science, I did spend quite a lot of time uh, talking about uh, uh, some illustrations of our prowess in science by discussing what and how the advances in our basic understanding of how cells work, what genes are, what genes do for our cells, uh, we've made progress against cancer. And I, I illustrated um, that progress by talking about four specific types of cancer, emphasizing that all cancers are different, the cancers arise in many different organs, that when they arise in different organs, they affect different types of cells, uh, and even when you have a cancer that arises in the same cell type in different people, it will have a different constellation of mutations that have occurred during a person's lifetime that drive uh, the behavior of that cancer cell. I've tried to illustrate what we're doing uh, in the realm of, of cancer prevention and cancer treatment by talking about those four examples. Uh, I also went on to talk uh, uh, more broadly about some social changes that have occurred uh, in, in science, the new attention to global health, um, the changes in publication practice that make uh, publication practices more open, and I talked also about some of the intersections between the government and, and the scientific community that result from, uh, from budgetary change. And just at that point, we had gone through a recession, uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the funding of the NIH was actually rather sporadic, with a large uh, dose of money coming from the Recovery Act, and then cuts in our base budget, and I talked about some of the um, effects of those budgetary maneuvers <coughs> on the, the spirit among young scientists. Now today what I'd like to do is to not speak in such a grand scale, but talk um, in a little more granular way about what's been happening with those four cancer types in the interval. I'd like to talk about how um, some of the advances that have been made have begun to solidify themselves into kinds of formal policies that uh, the president and the vice president are heavily involved with. And I think you'll recollect some of these terms, the Precision Medicine Initiative and the Biden Moonshot, and I'll try to explain what those things are about. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some uh, deeper changes in the structure of science and the structure of the scientific community, uh, in a sense, those two being, being social changes. And I will brag a moment about what's happened to the National Cancer Institute uh, during my tenure there. And I have to say there's a certain symmetry here. I arrived to give the talk in 2011 after being uh, at the National Cancer Institute for a year, 
And now I'm speaking here in 2016, uh, having left one year ago uh, to take uh, two new positions in New York, one at the, uh, at the Meyer Cancer Center at the Cornell Medical School and another at the new, newly formed New York Genome Center. So my perspective is somewhat different. Life has changed in some ways. And what I'm going to try to do in roughly a half an hour or so, my wife keeps saying, you keep them begging for more. Maybe it'll be a little bit more. Uh, and, but hopefully some time for questions. Uh, and uh, hopefully enough, to enough uh, topics that uh, interest you to be able to, um, to incite some questions from the audience before we have to clear out of the room at 2.30. So when I spoke last time, um, uh, Sid Mukherjee's great book had just been published. Now it's a uh, last year it was a PBS miniseries. I highly recommend it. Um, but uh, his examples are not exactly mine, but they're similar. I talked last time about uh, these four topics, the common form of adult leukemia, uh, lung cancer in general, some things about cervical cancer, uh, and, uh, and melanoma. And let me just give you a few snippets from what I said last time and some updates, and uh, then move on to, to broader issues. So I told you that, uh, that chronic myeloid leukemia, a disease that affects about 6,000 patients each year as new diagnoses, that translates roughly into 20 times more worldwide, um, is a disease that occurs at age, roughly age 50 uh, and um, used to be a death sentence after the, the, the uh, survival time of about five years from diagnosis. But uh, in, in 1999, a new drug uh, was tested that proved to be, and still is, the poster child for what we generally call precision medicine or, or individualized medicine, a drug that is used to treat leukemias not just because it kills leukemic cells, but because it specifically targets an enzyme that's gone awry in the generation of this disease. I'm not going to take, take you through the history of this disease. It's a fascinating disease because uh, virtually every case has the same abnormal chromosome, an abnormal chromosome that forms during an during, uh, individual's lifetime. And that, in, that um, abnormal chromosome joins two chromosomes in a way that generates uh, a persistently active enzyme that, when unleashed in that way, drives cells to malignant behavior. But the drug in question uh, represents the fulfillment of the work that many of us have done, have been doing over the last 20 or 30 years, trying to identify the genes that get mutated in the course of developing a cancer. And the idea was if we can reverse the actions of those abnormal mutant proteins, we can do something about cancer. And indeed, in this setting, uh, a drug that inhibits the enzymatic activity of the mutant gene, um, the drug is shown in green in a uh, and a profile of the three-dimensional structure of the bad protein. Uh, and uh, this drug, which many of you probably heard about, called Gleevec, it makes $5 billion a year for, for Novartis at this point. Um, and, uh, and this turns out to be a drug with a lot of interesting <coughs> properties that I won't review. But the main point is that it restores a normal life expectancy to patients with this disease. And that's pretty great. Now, some patients develop resistance to this drug because the gene undergoes additional mutations that render it resistant to the drug. And we have lots of additional drugs now uh, to combat resistance and the, the claim that life expectancy is normal for people, for people with this disease is still true. Uh, but it's also true that Gleevec is the, is the poster child for precision medicine. Now, lung cancer, much more difficult problem, affecting a lot more people, uh, over a million deaths per year globally, um, about 180,000 diagnoses in the US, uh, and uh, with a life expectancy uh, of only a couple of years on average. Um, uh, most of these cancers, as you all know, are, are 80, or roughly 85% are tobacco related. Um, there are several different cell types, but many more types when we look at individual mutations. And at that point, we had a couple of new drugs <coughs> specifically targeted against mutations that occurred in a relatively small percent, 3%, 12 or 15% of, of these cancers. And there was also a new development in 2011, and that is that uh, uh, so-called computer tomography uh, scans, a kind of x-ray, uh, can detect uh, these cancers and had been shown by a massive study carried out by the National Cancer Institute uh, to reduce mortality 
in older patients who smoke by about 20%. And there's quite a bit of news now. <coughs> The bad news is that as smoking increases, especially in developing countries that have increased resources for purchasing tobacco products, the number of cases worldwide has gone up. Uh, the screening procedure that was, had just been, just been uh, reported on when I was here five years ago has now been approved um, by, uh, by, by the Medicare Center uh, for reimbursement and is being fairly widely used. And there are a lot more genetic targets and more drugs to treat them. So, if you think about a pie chart that represents uh, one, the most common form of lung cancer, so-called lung adenocarcinoma, uh, there are a couple of genes that, are no, uh, that uh, we don't have drugs for, especially the gene called KRAS in the lower right, and then there's some uh, quarter of the tumors we don't really have a culprit for, but the others, they break down into a lot of genes with, with mutations that are responsible for these cancers. And for many of these, we now have drugs that are, that are at least useful um, for, in general, for a fairly s short period of time, one to two years before resistance emerges. But quite a few other drugs that are in testing uh, look very promising for treating uh, the cancers with other known mutations. Uh, so that represents a, a lot of advances, improved screening. Um, we still need better ways to reduce uh, smoking. Um, I heard an interesting question uh, at Pity Martin's uh, uh, Q&A about does, whether smoking should be allowed on campus. And I think there might be a rationale for trying to avoid um, anyone smoking on this campus. Right now, smoking is only restricted in buildings. Uh, I still remember exam week, I'll say 1958, when, uh, I think Peter remembers this as well, when Paul Mall uh, left a carton of cigarettes on our on our beds for the first time. <laughs> tobacco habit. Well, things have improved beyond that, but we think it would be irrational. We haven't driven down smoking rates in this country for some years. They're, they're about 19% of Americans smoke. It was 44% when we went to college, um, but we, we could do better. Um, I also talked about cervical cancer as an example of how we can prevent cancer more effectively and to introduce a couple of personalities. Uh, many of you know that, that we've reduced mortality from cervical cancer in this country by introducing the pap smear many, many years ago. It didn't require molecular biology or fancy genetics, just a method for detecting an early stage of the disease and treating it uh, surgically at a very early stage. Uh, and at this point uh, in the U.S., there are about 11,000 cases of cervical cancer, about 3,000 deaths. Well, in other parts of the world where cervical cancer is not detected by pap smears, the incidence and mortality is much, much higher. Uh, and happily, we now have a way of avoiding the infection that leads to this disease, infections with certain strains of what are called human papillomaviruses. And uh, uh, it is a mark of distinction for Amherst College that the, the, uh, the development of that vaccine, um, actually a series of vaccines, is attributable to the work of, of uh, one of our um, fellow alumni, uh, namely, uh, um, uh, Doug Lowy, whose brother Marty was in our class. Uh, Doug, um, in 19, sorry, 2011, when I gave the first version of this talk, part one, uh, Doug had just recently agreed to be my deputy director at the NIH, uh, and there's a bit of happy news to report. Um, uh, in addition to my departure from the NCI, Doug is now the acting director of NCI, and probably will be another year, year and a half, two years, depending on what happens in November. <laughs> the country's still here, he'll be there. <laughs> um, so those are all interesting developments. The vaccine, as the previous slide indicated, has been improved. Uh, there are many different strains of papillomavirus. Some are major causes of, of cervical cancer, some much more minor causes. And there are increasing numbers of papillomavirus strains uh, covered by the vaccine. The last disease I mentioned last time was metastatic melanoma, uh, one of the few cancers that's rising in incidence in the U.S. Uh, and uh, there, we know enough about the genetics of this disease to know that about 50% of metastatic cases have a mutation in a gene against which we have a drug. And that drug does produce a very strong remission. Uh, however, resistance to that, that, uh, that drug uh, arises on average in about seven or eight months. You've got to remember, when I give these statistics, they are averages. There are patients who go for years on the drug, doing very well. Some uh, have very limited response in the beginning. Uh, one of the problems in, 
in drug pricing for cancer drugs that we've all heard about is that uh, that the responses are not predictable and everybody wants to live and uh, therefore it's possible to charge high prices for drugs that have limited benefit in any event uh, just at this point uh, uh, there was the first glimmerings of, of uh, dramatic success in using a form of immunotherapy that I will elaborate on in a bit more detail in a couple of moments. Uh, an antibody that puts a great, uh, well, an antibody that, that, that counteracts the effect of, a, of an inherent break in the immune system releasing the body's response to cancer cells. And this theme, which I'll return to in a couple of moments, uh, was first uh, emphasized um, in the, in the response of patients with metastatic melanoma to one of those antibodies. And um, uh, now we have additional antibodies, as you'll hear, that have led to dramatically improved results. Uh, patients who receive these antibodies can have a, a very durable remission that lasts five or 10 years. Uh, and um, uh, there are now additional antibodies, so the chances of responding to these antibodies has risen from about 10 to 15 percent to something more like 70 to 80 percent. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time uh, not playing back and forth between 2011 and today, but instead telling you something about what's happening uh, in cancer research in the broader context of politics and society. I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, new principles, ways we think about the activity of cancer research and how that's being endorsed, if not richly uh, financially uh, supported by, by national politics. I want to tell you a little bit about some of the pragmatic aspects of these new practices, that is, what kinds of ways is medical practice going to change, who's going to pay for them, uh, and uh, uh, what is most important to, to work for. And then I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some new things, some things that have happened at the NCI during my five years there, uh, and a problem that uh, continues to permeate the scientific community and anxiety about uh, the competition and in uh, in, for grants and other things that is uh, changing the, the mood in which we work and I believe having a detrimental effect on our approach to, to cancer and many other diseases. So let me tell you first a little bit about uh, uh, the, this new notion, the, the new picture of the ecosystem in which, um, in which uh, cancer is being studied. So shortly after I talked here five years ago, the Institute of Medicine issued a report uh, that was called, uh, um, what was it called? Something like uh, Bringing Physician Medicine to Reality, I can't remember, something like that. Uh, and uh, it envisioned uh, at the core of our research activities basically a big database, a knowledge network in which information was being fed in from clinical care of patients, from clinical research, from basic research, uh, from chemistry, from uh, drug trials, uh, and that network was fundamentally changing the taxonomy of cancer. Instead of worrying about uh, whether a cancer arose in one organ or another, uh, we begin to think about whether a cancer had mutations that were driving cancerous behavior that occurred in one gene or another. That proved to be a very important aspect of understanding any individual's cancer. Uh, that network informed the way clinical medicine is conducted, the way biomedical <laughs> research is conducted. I see in my own lab, most of what we do is influenced by what is in the knowledge network, uh, and uh, that uh, leads to mechanistic studies of various kinds, discoveries that then feed back into this, uh, into this um, reinforcing uh, loop of knowledge. Uh, the notion of precision medicine, in which therapies are grounded in our understanding in in gory detail of what, uh, of how a cancer has arisen and what is driving uh, the, the behavior of that cancer has become institutionalized at the highest level. Uh, the president having announced uh, in February, uh, January of 2015 when I was still in Washington, down in the front row here uh, in the East Room, uh, and he <coughs> laid out uh, his understanding of how blood transfusions are based on understanding uh, what blood types people have and cancers are treated, knowing what mutations people have in their cancers and uh, heart disease is treated more and more frequently by knowing precisely what is wrong with the heart muscle or the vessels. Uh, and uh, he was urging that we spend more money 
which, of course, the president does not give out. Congress gives out more money, and uh, but a certain proportion of what the NIH received, whether it's more or less, is going to be devoted to this idea of precision medicine, which we were, frankly, doing anyway. Um, but um, this, in my view, was an important articulation of the way in which we're now thinking about disease, uh, and has influenced the, the, the way in which we um, which we uh, practice, and this is a, a movie my wife suggested I not the show. The budget I sent this to Congress uh, on Monday will include a new precision medicine initiative that brings America closer to curing diseases like cancer and diabetes, okay. and she gives said I was, all of us. It's too long, so I'm going to cut it off. Um, <laughs> I could win some harmony at home, uh, and point out to you that this is a totally different moment than the moment in 1971. It was. December 23rd, 1971, uh, when influenced by Mary Laster and others, uh, Richard Nixon signed the National Cancer Institute, said we should cure cancer in our lifetimes. Uh, people call that the beginning of the war on cancer. He had no idea how we'd do this. I think we know something about how we can make great progress against cancer and many other diseases now that we know much more than we did, uh, whatever it was, 45 years ago. Um, when Nixon signed that act. But Nixon did provide something very important, lots of money. Um, he went to Congress, and Congress did boost the budget for the National Cancer Institute tremendously, and people like me benefited enormously from having those additional resources. This time, perhaps uh, arguably more resources, very little, I would say, uh, but a lot of uh, very well schooled enthusiasm for what we do. And I would remind you that in this era, which there's still a lot of people out there bashing President Obama, you're going to miss him. Uh, he understands more about science and the scientific process than any president I've dealt with. And uh, his statements about precision medicine are not only well conceived, but they're grounded in real knowledge. Uh, he knows what he's talking about here. And I, I spent a year and a half on um, his uh, Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, and he was incredibly impressive in that role. Um, now, Another early uh, event in the history of government interactions with science uh, was we call um, the, the moonshot, a real moonshot, uh, one that was uh, uh, initiated um, in part in response to Sputnik uh, when President Kennedy went to Congress and said he wanted the money to send a man to the moon. Uh, and uh, he shown in the middle uh, overseeing uh, rocket development at Cape Canaveral, now Cape Kennedy. Uh, and we did send a man to the moon very precise thing. Earth to the moon, moon to the earth. Uh, and uh, you know, we knew what we were talking about. Now we have another kind of moonshot. Um, uh, President uh, Obama here presenting uh, the, the notion that, that Joe Biden would have jurisdiction over an initiative in the cancer domain uh, in his State of the Union address uh, just this January. Um, here, the, the, the goals are a little less clear. Um, what I think is extremely valuable about this moonshot is that while we don't have a specific goal, there is no moon that Biden is shooting for. There's no date to get there and get back to Earth. But what he has said is that uh, he knows we can go faster. You know, whatever it will take, we can do it in less time. If we make better use of our ability to work together, if we try to elim eliminate some barriers to progress against cancer, and I will come back to one specific one in just about Six minutes. Um, so let me talk a little bit about these pragmatic aspects of how we um, put into practice the kinds of things we talk about when we talk about precision medicine and moonshots and advances against cancer. And as you saw from that big diagram of uh, the, the new scientific ec ecosystem that uh, reflects what precision medicine is all about, uh, Carrying out tests to classify uh, uh, cancers, to create a new taxonomy of cancers, is incredibly important. These tests involve uh, a variety of, of operations, but mostly they involve taking DNA from cancers and looking to see what's wrong with the DNA, which genes are damaged, how are they damaged, uh, and trying to uh, assign <coughs> names to those cancers so that we can think about uh, either preventing them in others or, or curing them in patients who have those diseases. And indeed, when you line up the possible benefits of doing these kinds of genetic tests, uh, you can see that there are lots of, lots of things. We talked about 
uh, making uh, better diagnoses, choosing the right therapy, and making predictions about what the outcome might be, uh, looking for evidence that the cells might be resistant to certain drugs, could even imagine doing some kind of very, uh, very early stage detection. Uh, but the fact is that the uptake of these tests, in my view, have been relatively slow. The great cancer centers, Sloan Kettering, Dana-Farber, MD Anderson, and others do these tests on virtually every patient. But if you go to many other hospitals, even in my affluent area in New York City, um, you'll find that many hospitals, including some academic hospitals, don't offer such tests, uh, that the uptake um, is in a sense, inequitable. If you're at Sloan Kettering, you get the you get the right treatment. If you go to Queens Hospital, you may or may not, and you almost certainly won't get these kinds of tests. Uh, and so this raises a question: Do the tests have measurable value? Because people, health economists who are worried about expenditure on health, uh, are, can be critical of uh, technical innovations that are costly. Uh, and there are, frankly, have not been too many efforts to try to understand the, the, the cost benefit. <coughs> One such effort was carried out about a decade ago in France, where they have a highly logical, well-organized system that emanates from Paris, and every cancer center in the country was told uh, once a new drug was found that is useful in about 10% of lung cancer patients that that test should be used. They did a little experiment in which um, testing was carried out on all patients with lung adenocarcinoma. They spent uh, 1.7 million euros on the test, and they were able to say 1,724 were positive. They got the appropriate treatment for long term. Uh, the other 15,000 got very short term treatment until the test came back. And they saved 69 million euros by having tested those patients. Uh, and uh, spend only 35 million on the drug, you can see there's a, there's a major cost benefit here uh, by, by carrying out this, this kind of test. Well, such evidence is still fairly sparse, so one has to ask who's going to pay for these tests? And of course, someone who's going to pay is first going to ask, well, what is the test? And unfortunately, while I hate to introduce complexity here, uh, there are going to be variable costs for tests of different kinds. And we now have a tremendously powerful set of tools for analyzing a cancer's DNA. We can sequence what we call the whole genome, that is all the DNA and all the chromosomes. Uh, that is uh, most costly. Um, the number of times you determine the sequence of any, of any genetic region is going to be lower, the accuracy goes down. Uh, we can do all the regions that code for proteins. We can do more targeted sequence for tens or hundreds of genes, and that will influence the cost. So that's a variable that I can't ignore, but the, the <coughs> fact is that right now, uh, when we come to the question of will there be financial coverage to institutions or docs who ask for these tests, the question is we're not certain. There's no government-wide policy yet. There's no uh, completely reliable data on, on the utility of these tests. Uh, right now, in practice, as I talk to my colleagues, maybe 50% uh, get <coughs> partially reimbursed for doing them. Uh, the, the decisions about whether to use the test is blurred because one of the reasons for doing these tests is to learn more about cancer and make better decisions later on. And I would argue here's a place where Joe Biden can really have a big effect. He can go to the Center for Medicare Services and say, we should cover these tests, or at least uh, we need a number of them, uh, so that uh, we will learn what we need to learn to make sensible coverage decisions in the future and apply these tests uh, to the right patients. So obviously, to have better tests, cheaper tests, um, more effective tests, we need a diagnostics industry. That industry has always suffered in comparison to the drug industry, which makes huge profits. Uh, and uh, uh, are we encouraging that industry? And here, again, there's uh, a lot of argument. Um, uh, as the bottom bullet points out, this is a growing area. There are at least 20 or 30 companies that I know about that are trying to develop new diagnostic tests in the cancer arena. Uh, but the profits are small. The regulatory apparatus is not clear. Uh, the, the coverage determinations are still uncertain, as I've illustrated. Uh, there's really very little standardized use, even among New York institutions, which come down to the Genome Center every month and talk to each other. We still don't have 
simple rules that uh, allow us all to be doing more or less the same thing. One promising area I want to draw something new you haven't heard about to your attention is the notion of what we call a liquid biopsy. You're all familiar with the idea that you may have cancer, you get a sample of your tissue taken and it gets analyzed, um, but there is the potential um, uh, even in the realm of solid tumors as opposed to tumors of the blood like leukemias, for taking a blood sample and testing the blood for uh, DNA that is circulating having entered the bloodstream from the tumor site. And uh, especially if you already know something about a cancer that someone has, uh, has developed, uh, we, can, we can use this kind of liquid biopsy now. Still not in standard use, no rules about coverage and so forth, but uh, this appears to be extremely useful for monitoring how patients are responding to treatment. Uh, whether the, how uh, it's very useful in watching for recurrence of tumors, looking for early signs of drug resistance, and so forth. Okay, if all the time permits on that topic. Let me just conclude with a few things about, about uh, uh, programs and problems at the National Cancer Institute. So I'm going to begin um, with a, uh, a moment of immodesty, talking about some of the things that, that happened in my five years there. Um, and. Uh, all the legacies are not, but uh, maybe some of them are inappropriately uh, uh, self-attributed, but uh, nevertheless, some, some of these things did happen. Uh, I, see, uh, I see Mark Goyer in the back, and who was involved in the Cancer Genome Atlas Project as a, as a leader of the, uh, the uh, Human Genome Search Institute. Uh, but the NCI, together with the Genome Institute, put together the Cancer Genome Atlas, which is a compendium of many of the genetic abnormalities that occurred in roughly three to 500 examples of roughly 20 types of cancer. This is now a daily resource for cancer investigators all over the world. Uh, databases are freely available to the NIH to look at the data in this atlas. This is, um, one, this is an accomplishment that was made possible by uh, Arlen Specter's uh, support for a large dose of money in the Recovery Act of 2009. Uh, so that was a, 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 that's been a major triumph, which you know, many people are responsible, but hey, finished under my watch, so <laughs> thanks for credit for it. Um, we've, you may remember that when I showed you that pie chart for lung cancers, uh, there was a, uh, a quadrant called RAS mutant cancers um, of the lung. Uh, RAS is a gene or set of genes that are mutated in virtually every cancer, every case of pancreatic cancer, about 50% of colon cancers, and we don't have any way yet to effectively treat uh, patients who have um, cancers that are driven by mutations in the RAS genes. And during my time at the NCI, we set up a, a national program at a contract program that the NCI operates in Frederick, Maryland. Uh, and uh, we're trying to coordinate uh, a large-scale effort to find ways to conquer uh, the cancers that are uh, driven by mutant RAS genes. Uh, as I discussed in 2011, there's increasing interest in studying chronic non-infectious disease as part of a global health agenda for this country. And uh, the NCI uh, set up over the last five years a Center for Global Health that's working in a number of countries, uh, India, China, uh, Turkey, Mexico, and a few others, uh, trying to get uh, health ministries to recognize the importance of taking steps to prevent cancer, to institute some of the treatments that uh, are available even under fairly restricted uh, uh, conditions. Um, and uh, the, the effort that's been made, not just in the US, but in other, other places in Europe, to put cancer and other chronic diseases on the menu for, for improvements in global health is, is I think, uh, starting to yield some benefits. Some of this may seem a little technical, but the, and I, and the NCI, like the other institutes of the NIH, is involved in spending the money that most American biomedical scientists use, and the way grants are given out is imperfect. Um, one of the things, among the things I've tried to do in my time there was to develop some new grant programs. Uh, one was to get people out of their usual trap and think about some of the great unanswered so-called provocative questions in cancer research. We bring people together to have workshops to define the provocative questions, give out a lot of grants to try to answer these questions, and that um, is, I think, a 
the beneficial effort, a little hard to know what the outcome is in hard terms. Um, there is, uh, there's an increasing cohort of people who get trained as scientists, receive a PhD, sometimes an MD, who decide they don't want to be an individual investigator running a large laboratory group at an academic institution. That's a hard position to get these days, roughly one in 10 people who get a PhD in biological sciences, sciences end up running their own laboratory at an academic institution. Many of these folks don't want to work in industry. They'd like to be continu continuing at the workbench as staff scientists for a long career. And we, NCI now has a, a grant program for these, these folks who previously were not eligible. And then some of our best investigators beaten up by the, the tumult over um, the comp competition to get awards were, in the view of many of us, uh, too beleaguered by the, the frenzy of, of grant applications. And so we set up a, uh, an award, a large award for the best investigators, roughly 50 new ones every year, uh, who um, will receive a, a grant that will cover most of their research uh, for five, for seven years uh, to give them some respite from this continual um, need to, to reapply for grants. And um, the other thing that happened when I was there, for which I can take no personal credit as a scientist, but I uh, felt, uh, um, and, um, I feel emboldened to say this is something that I encouraged, was the emergence of immunotherapy as a, as a new way of, of, of treating cancers. And I want to give just a snapshot of what this is about, in my view, because it's uh, clearly of, uh, of um, uh, global importance and uh, uh, offers new possibilities for for cancer care. Now, so I'll give you a brief synopsis here. Immunotherapy is not a new idea. For 100 years, people have been thinking about it, and there was actually some success at uh, uh, on the Upper East Side of New York in the, in the early days of the last century. Um, but immunology clearly became important in cancer research about 25 years ago when it was possible to make antibodies, so-called monoclonal <coughs> antibodies, that were specific for proteins on the, that were abundant on the surface of some, some cells. You all know about these because you know what Herceptin is. Uh, you think of it as a drug, but it's actually an antibody which reacts with a protein known as HER2 that's abundant on the surface of breast cancer cells in about 20% of, of, of breast cancer patients. Um, some investigators, including my own mentor when I was a trainee at the NIH, have taken those antibodies and made them <laughs> Uh, more effective by tagging onto the antibodies, poisons that, that, uh, that uh, tend to kill cancer cells. Uh, and you've heard a lot, probably, or if you, if you follow this uh, spiel in the newspaper, about uh, T cells, a, a form of the immune system that can be re-engineered with, with genetic engineering to react with proteins that are present on the surface of cells. And these so-called uh, CARS uh, cells uh, have um, a certain attraction that people are excited about, but it's still very difficult. But what's really blown this field open and dramatically enhanced uh, our attitude toward, toward immunotherapy is the production of antibodies that inhibit a native um, breaking system in, the, in, 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 the, in, in our immune system. You can understand why regulating the immune system is very important. You don't want your own immune cells to react with your own cells. You want them to react to foreign stuff. So, Having breaks in the immune system is a good idea, but in the realm of cancer, uh, the response, an appropriate response to new kinds of proteins made in cancer cells uh, has been one of the limitations in trying to de devise ways to develop, to incite the immune system to react against cancers. And even when I spoke here five years ago, uh, the FDA was just on the verge of giving approval, which it did a few months later, to the first of those antibodies, an antibody against one of these um, proteins that are constituents of the breaks on the immune system. And since then, there have been several more proteins, I've listed a couple of them here, that interfere with uh, the ability of the major um, reactive arm of the immune system, T cells, uh, to um, respond to the presence of, of tumor cells, which have new kinds of foreign proteins, because you'll recall my saying that all these cancers have mutations. Mutations make funny proteins that, the, the, that our immune systems should, should reject. So when you can block the, the breaks, 
you enhance the reactivity of the immune system and, uh, and release the immune system to, to react uh, against cancers. I've mentioned this in the context of melanoma, where many of, this, many of these uh, trials uh, were initially done, but now we know that there are many other kinds of cancers, which in, uh, in a, a modest number of cases, uh, bladder cancer, renal cancer, some lung cancers, even a few colon cancers, will respond to these uh, so-called checkpoint inhibitors. Um, we're learning that, uh, that there are prospects for using combinations, not just of more than one antibody, but combinations of antibodies used with so-called targeted drugs I've been discussing, um, with radiotherapy, with chemotherapy, to enhance the reactivity. Um, importantly, um, we still don't know what the foreignness, so-called antigenicity, is in a cancer cell. And that's been many efforts underway, some of it from private donors that we've been reading about in the last few weeks, some of it uh, um, in, with, with incentives provided by uh, Joe Biden's use of the bully pulpit, some coming out of uh, efforts made by precision medicine institutes that now are legion at uh, academic health centers to define what kind of abnormal protein is most likely to induce an immune response. And I point out an irony here, one of the things that makes cancer research and cancer care very difficult right now is that there are many, many tens, hundreds, thousands, sometimes even tens of thousands of mutations in any single cell. And some of those mutations are important in driving the abnormal function of the cell, making it a cancer. But some of the abnormalities are uh, just passenger mutations, and but those passengers produce proteins. Proteins are abnormal and, and are potentially uh, uh, stimulus to the immune system. And uh, so this, the one thing that does correlate with a response to immunotherapy is a high number of mutations in the individual cancer. One might think that was a bad thing uh, to have a lot of mutations, but actually it might be a good thing because it makes the cells more reactive uh, with the immune system. Okay, so um, this is all well, good news. I want to conclude um, with something that is <coughs> pertinent to the educational experience that we're all that we're all celebrating here at this alumni weekend, and that is um, why, despite all this incredible opportunity, all these exciting things that are happening in cancer research, why is there uh, a tremendous amount of, uh, of unhappiness within? Uh, the workforce of the biomedical community, people who have been trained colleges and medical schools or, or uh, universities for PhDs, uh, usually with many years of postdoctoral training, these folks um, in general are not that happy. And the, the fundamental issue is a Malthusian one, uh, as the, this community has grown very fast, the NIH budget doubled in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, new programs were established, many people went into biomedical research, and now there's clearly an imbalance between the number of people out there and the number of research grants and jobs, and even positions uh, for publication in the most uh, revered journals. And uh, I've been involved in trying to do something about this through a group we call ourselves Rescuing Biomedical Research. Uh, but we published a paper a couple of years ago that summarized some of the problems. And the, the guts of this is hypercompetition. There's too much. Uh, too many people pursuing the same grants, jobs, and, and slots, I'm going to call the, the cell, nature, and science, or central nervous system, CNS journals. <laughs> and uh, and um, we've, as I'll show you in a moment, the demography of our community has changed. Um, under these pressures, we've distorted the evaluation metrics that we use. Uh, we tend to emphasize whether you've published in a certain place as opposed to whether you've published or whether you've done good work. And all that has produced a kind of loss of confidence in our system. Um, people have less leisure. When they have less leisure, they don't think as freely as they should. They're concerned about doing things they think will, will please peer reviewers or the NIH uh, brass. Uh, and they focus too much on whether or not their work is likely to have some kind of impact or be translated into the clinic. Um, the dem dem demographic changes are dramatic. Uh, we've had, uh, over the last uh, roughly 30 years or so, uh, a 
over fourfold drop in the number of people who are 36 or younger who are, who are uh, receiving NIH grants. And roughly, uh, I hesitate to criticize this, a majority of the roughly 10% increase in, sorry, 10, 10x increase in the number of people 66 or older. Now that's a good thing. People should have long careers in science if they're able to pass peer review. But the loss of uh, individuals who are youthful at the best, at the most productive stages uh, is, is uh, uh, a warning signal that something is wrong with the way things go. Here is one version of a typical academic career path today. Um, people that graduate when they're 22 it's, have a couple of, uh, of wander, wander years, enter graduate school, spend six or seven years getting a PhD do one or two postdoctoral training periods, get a faculty job in their, their late 30s, apply for an NIH grant after a couple of years, finally get it and start it on their way to their 20th reunion. Uh, that's not the way the world should work. And uh, these are sobering numbers. They are averages. There are still people who zip through the system and get great work done in their early 30s. But this is a troubling fact of life. Uh, our workforce, epitomized by or symbolized by uh, the figure in red is crucial to combating cancer. And uh, many of you are interested in further uh, information about uh, how we're trying to combat the current atmosphere at a time when science is so promising. You should go to our website at, uh, at rescuingbiomedicalresearchoneword.org. But before you do that, we can have questions and answers. There's a circulating microphone and uh, welcome questions, except questions about your own health. <laughs> question down here. My question is, um, given all the chemicals in the atmosphere and the hormones in the food, have you figured out why we have so much cancer other than the smoking, which is obvious? Yeah, well, but the smoking, in a sense, is, the, is part of the answer. Um, what drives cancers, as I've tried to emphasize over and over again, is mutations. So it's not as though there's, um, there's a debate between the genetic and the environmental origins of cancer. Environmental influences are one set of uh, factors that, that can drive mutational process. And what is present in tobacco smoke are chemicals that, that cause changes in DNA, cause mutations. The other factors in the environment are much more subtle. Uh, tobacco is a big one, but uh, asbestos, small cut of pie now because we've got rid of asbestos for most of our buildings, but for the most part, saying that our diet is causing cancer is, is probably, is for the most part, spurious. It's very difficult to get out of the convincing. We do have an inherent error-prone mechanism by which we copy our DNA and separate our chromosomes into daughter cells. People often forget that we are set up as error-prone um, error organisms, and that is important because we would never have progressed from that primitive initial life form into the diversity of species that we see today if there weren't changes. So we're programmed to, to have changes, and some of those changes will lead to cancerous change. So a substantial part of of cancer is not attributable to specific environmental influences that simply inherit the way our cells work. Copying three billion base pairs accurately is not easy. <laughs> Take the question right here. A far out question about NIH and space. The NIH has several times attempted to work with, work, work with NASA to use the uh, opportunities of space research from Neuralab to the, you know, the aging of John Glenn flight, now to the space station. Can you, any comments on it, either its effectiveness or its promise? Okay, when you said NIH in space, I thought you were talking about space to do research. <laughs> Teens who take away your space because you didn't get your NIH grant. That's the kind of NIH in space problem that, that many of us experience. Um, but uh, no, I've been, of course, well acquainted with the, with the efforts from NASA and, and to collaborate. I would say a couple of things. First, it's important if we're going to send people into space that we be concerned about the health of the astronauts. And that collaboration, definitely important. Very important to know before you plan a journey to Mars or a journey to an asteroid, whether or not people can survive uh, under 
influence of radiation in space and uh, deprivation of gravity. And those studies of the health of astronauts are critical and a, a definite way in which uh, we should work. Now, there's a, a twin study that was just done. One Kelly twin went up uh, for a couple of years, another Kelly twin on Earth. And we're going to do some comparisons. One of my colleagues, Chris Mason at Cornell, is working on that. I don't think we're going to learn too much from that, frankly. Uh, there, are other, there are other studies that are done, for example, how do cells behave in space? Now, I think maybe it's interesting. I'm not sure. Uh, you know, you grow, you grow cell culture in zero gravity, and you, you know, but what is the question? I'm not sure whether we have a good question there that will be of um, major significance. I'm, you know, that's a cheap, you know, you've got to gauge these answers with respect to what the costs are. And that, that's a cheap thing to do. They're doing a lot of experiments anyway. You want to grow some, some cells in space, see what happens. I think that's worth doing. Um, is it, that's okay. Is that the, uh, uh, one of the things I was curious about is um, our, our, our extended lifespan. Um, how much of a factor that is that you know, 10,000 years ago, if you lived to be 30, you were an old man. Um, now as we get to we live longer and longer, it's sort of talk about making copies of copies of copies of copies. After a while, you get fuzzier and fuzzier. Um, how much is that, is that really a factor or can they go bonkos right off the beginning and it's pretty much the same all the way through? As far as... Now, it's your question about in cancer in with age? Increased uh, mutations as you get yeah. older. Okay, so here's some interesting things. I mean, in general, the older you are, the more likely you to develop cancer. But, but if you look at the peak, the, the peak age for incidence of, of most cancers, the peak is not out at the right, when it's, when it's, that is not at the oldest ages. So the peak incidence for breast cancer, for example, is about 61 or 62. The peak incidence for chronic myeloid leukemia, which we talked about earlier, is about 50. So it's not as though, and then there are pediatric cancers of certain types that, uh, that hold. So there's a, there's, it's not just about duration of life and mutation frequency. It's also about the nature of the cells that are going through a growing process. One of my colleagues got beaten up in the literature for saying there was a simple correlation between the number of doublings a cell had gone through in any specific organ, the number of cells that are carrying out that reproductive process to, to repopulate an organ that can allow you to predict the average age at which those cancers occur. And you know, he was criticized because the data, the underlying data weren't very secure. But I think the concept is probably true. Uh, great example of that, a, a cancer called retinoblastoma. It's a, it's a cancer of the eye that occurs only under the age of five, never seen beyond that. And it's because the cell type that becomes a retinoblastoma is only around for about five years. After that, the cell type in which that disease appears doesn't exist. So things are a little more complicated than just counting mutations. And I think another way to think about this is not every cell in our body can become a cancer. That uh, mutations will affect one cell type and not another. Remember that in every organ, you have a lineage of development. <coughs> A stem cell for that organ, then cells that are more and more differentiated as time goes on. And as differentiation occurs, the cells have a limited, more and more limited growth potential. So mutations at a later stage are less likely to turn that cell into a cancer cell. So I'm glad you asked the question, but it's one of those provocative questions. You know, what, um, my wife loves the provocative question about certain kinds of animals. There are, it's alleged that elephants don't have as many cancers as they should, given the number of cells in a single elephant. Um, but um, more to her point, the naked mole rat, a rodent, uh, which uh, unlike mice, never gets cancer, should have cancer. So there are obviously some reasons that the development of a cancer is restrained in, in that animal. So. Uh, it's clear that there's some animals with very infrequent cancers, sharks, whales, a few others, especially considering their bulk, their number of cells. So there are some important questions to ask in if you think about the relationship of age to cancer development, and if we think about body size, types of, types of organism. Dr. Haskell. <coughs> what is the heritability of, can 
what is the heritability of cancer development of the you know the various genetic changes that you have described and uh, what is the ratio of people who die of cancer relative to parents who die of cancer? Okay, well let me deal with the first part. I'm glad you asked that because I focused my talk today for simplicity on the mutations that occur in our lifetimes, which are the major drivers of cancers that affect most of us. But there are a significant number of cancers that arise as a result of inherited variants, call them. They are mutations in a sense, but they're variants in the population. I mentioned a disease, retinoblastoma, a moment ago. About two-thirds of retinoblastomas are the result of inheriting one bad gene. And um, in a sense, it's, it's very useful to know that because you can observe those kids from birth and use lasers to prevent any of the cancers from arising. But there's a simple case in which there's a kind of Mendelian pa pattern of inheritance. Most people in this audience will know about the, the, the genes called BRCA or BRCA1 and 2 that when inherited in certain mutant forms will predispose to breast and ovarian cancers. Now, in those situations, we know there are many there are mutations of various kinds that occur at different points in the gene. And for each one of those mutations, there's a different, what we call, penetrance, a, a different likelihood that those individuals will actually develop breast or ovarian cancer. That likelihood is probably influenced first by the nature of the mutation, second by the constellation of other variants in a person's chromosomes, and by uh, exposures to, um, to various uh, environmental agents that could be mutagenic. So um, my point here is that um, there's still a third level of mutations we don't have variations we don't understand very well yet that will influence the likelihood at some very low level and therefore be hard to detect. Um, so there's some mutations that make it very, very likely that you'll have a cancer. Some make it probable but not certain, and some make it uh, have a slight influence. The, for the, I should probably mention one other category. There are mutations that affect the ability of our cells to reproduce themselves accurately and to, uh, and to repair any mistakes in DNA sequence that might happen during, during cell, uh, cell division. And there are many individuals that have some of these so-called syndromes that can give rise to cancer in a wide variety of organs because, this, because uh, the individual cells lack the normal repertoire of proteins that are involved in repairing DNA. So, yes, overall, maybe a 10, 15 percent influence, um, but, uh, but it's significant. Uh, thank you. There appears to be an increase in frequency of pancreatic cancer. Do you believe that is true? And if so, what might be causing it? Well, I think your perception is like mine, that you've passed through an age group where a lot of your friends have this disease. It's a terrible disease. We've made very few advances, except understanding the, the genetic basis of the disease. There's been no appreciable in, increase in, in um, or improvement in treatment, and the vast majority of patients die uh, in less than five years. Um, the incidence has gone up very slightly when age adjusted. Um, slight increase, there are about 41,000 cases per year in the U.S., roughly 40,000 deaths per year, which tells you this is a bad, it's not those patients who are dying because life expectancy is about a year after diagnosis. Um, so terrible disease, um, I think we focus on it because it's one of the more common cancers Mortality is about equal to the mortality from breast cancer every year, but there are 220,000 cases of breast cancer diagnosed every year, you know, and, uh, but there are 40,000 deaths. So people say it's worse. I don't think that means much because um, if you're, I'm not sure how you weigh the difference between a disease that has many more people affected but the same uh, level of mortality. But uh, the thing that makes pancreatic cancer, particularly in the limelight, is that we've made so little progress in trying to treat it. For reasons we can get into if we had more time. We'll take one last question from the back. I need more ladies. Way in the back. I haven't seen it. Shout. Shout. We've got, we got to get out of here. Okay. <laughs> we, know, we know each other. Jennifer Smith, um, UNC class of 91. Um, 
As you know, one in six cancers are caused by infections, and hepatitis B and HPV can be prevented by vaccination, and Epstein-Barr virus is going to be on the horizon. I wanted to ask you what your view is about other infectious causes in the future and, and what you think needs to be done about looking at other causes in terms of prevention. Right. Well, it's, it's, I'm glad you brought that up. I, of course, alluded to it in the context of cervical cancer. Uh, and I would point out to the audience that uh, not only is human papillomavirus a cause of cervical cancer, it's also a cause of cancer in men. And in fact, the most dramatically rising cancer in the U.S. population is oropharyngeal cancer in, in young men. And people who don't get their kids, males and females, vaccinated with HPV vaccine are nuts. Uh, because this is a really protective thing. Now, in some poor countries like Uganda, uh, as you said, a very fairly high percentage of cancers, maybe a quarter, have an infectious origin. You've named several. Uh, the Epstein-Barr vaccine, which I'm a huge proponent of trying to promote, still, I think, quite a ways off. Uh, Epstein-Barr virus is actually responsible for a lot more cancers than we know, um, because it's not just um, uh, the, the, the common uh, uh, so-called Burkitt's lymphoma and nasopharyngeal cancer, but also 9% of gastric cancers and a certain, a certain number of Hodgkin's lymphomas and probably others. Uh, but the vaccine is going to be quite a ways off, I'm afraid. Um, are there other infectious causes? Well, I think we're gonna, they're going to turn up because we, we do genome sequencing. If, if, it, if an infectious agent is a cause of cancer, it's likely to be found in the, in the genome of the cancer. And, uh, and actually, that's the way the Kaposi sarcoma virus was found before the days when DNA sequencing was quite as common as it is today. But I think we'll turn them up. Uh, right now, I would say that uh, the, the rate of discovery has been quite low, which makes me think that uh, we're not going to suddenly find that the, the majority of cancers have an infectious origin. I think, guys, I'm going to be thrown off. I'll be happy to hang around after.